Hello everyone, welcome to part two of our Nightmare on Elm Street franchise review, where we are going over the entire Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. And this episode is going over the second, third, and fourth entry of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. We went over the first one on the last episode, so if you haven't yet, go back to last week's episode. We went over the first Nightmare on Elm Street film, go behind the scenes, talk about how Freddy Krueger started, and what made the first entry so iconic. Now we're going to talk about how the franchise continued, and how it really began to mold Freddy into what we know him to be today. Because the first film didn't really give us the Freddy Krueger that we, we know today. right? He wasn't cracking as many jokes as he does now, and he wasn't as menacing, and he didn't even talk as much as he does in future installments. And we're going to get into that. We're going to dive right in. We're going to get started with A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. We're not wasting any time on this episode here at the Cabin of Horrors. <laughs> We're going right in. So A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, started pre-production in April of 1985. Screenwriter Leslie Boheim, Boehm, I'm probably butchering that name, but they pitched the producers with the idea of using pregnancy and possess... They pitched the... He pitched the producers with his idea of using pregnancy and possession as a plot device for the second film, saying the concept was a homage to Rosemary's baby. He came up with a plot, and I quote, I came up with a plot that had a new family move into the house, a teenage boy, his pregnant mother, and a stepfather the boy didn't get along with. It was a real bloody, scary idea, much more physical and realistic, because the dream reality stuff was less central to these movies then. My story was more of a possession scenario, with Freddy getting inside the mother's womb, controlling the fetus. But New Line passed on it, because Sarah Risher was actually pregnant at the time, and, the, and I understand the idea upset her. So they went with David Chaskin's concept, concept instead. Though both films ended up using the spirit possession concept, the pregnancy idea, if, you, if you're if you thinking in the future here, would actually eventually be used in the sequel, A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, which Boehm also wrote the script for. When it came to the directorial duties of A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Robert Shea had offered Wes Craven the chance to direct again. Of course, he did a great job on the first one. But Wes Craven actually turned down the offer because he had a lot of problems with the script. Things like the possessed parakeet. <laughs> it seemed pretty ridiculous to him. And of uh, Freddy merging with the main character and manifesting in real life at the pool party to kill the teenagers... Craven thought it would just diminish Freddy's scare factor, as Robert Uglin wasn't tall enough in stature, and a lot of the teenagers were, well, much bigger than he was. Now, when it came to casting for A Nightmare on Elm... Now, when it came for casting on A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, New Line Cinema almost made the biggest mistake they could have ever made. Originally, they had wanted to save money and simply use an unnamed extra in a rubber mask to play Freddy. Because it had been the case for, you know, Friday the 13th with Jason Voorhees, Halloween with Michael Myers. It didn't matter who was quote-unquote behind the mask because the character itself is really what mattered. But they reconsidered it when they realized that the man had when they realized that using an unnamed extra really didn't have the posture or demeanor that Robert Ungland had in the first Freddy, because Robert Ungland's a classically trained physical actor, so he, he knows how to use his body movements, he knows how to use his facial expressions, so of course he was able to embody the role of Freddy so well in the first one, and you're not just going to get some random extra in a mask to be able to recreate that. 
So thankfully, New Line Cinema came to their senses and realized, no, we, we can't do this film without Robert Unkland. Too bad Michael Bay didn't have the same thought, eh? But anyways, we'll get to that in next week's episode. There is actually still a scene in the movie where they use the extra as Freddy Krueger. This is during Coach Schneider's death scene in the shower, though you can't really tell because there's excessive water steam. So it's hard to tell that it's not Unglin, but in that scene, it is the extra stunt double. It's not, it's not actually Unglin as Freddy. Principal photography on A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 Freddy's Revenge commenced in June 1985, and the director of the film, Jack Shoulder, had said in an interview that he had very little time to prepare, and the movie itself contained a lot of special effects, none of which he knew how to do. And the film's special effects... The film's special effects were headed by Kevin Yager, who handled Freddy's design, and Mark Showstrom, who was responsible for the transformation effects, where Freddy comes out of Jesse's body. David Miller, who created the makeup for the original Nightmare on Elm Street film, he unfortunately at the time was busy working on Cocoon and a film called My Science Project. No, 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 cut that. A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 Freddy's Revenge released on November 1st, 1985, and opened on 522 screens in the New York, Washington, Detroit, and Texas areas. And it was reported it made about $3,865,475. And it's reported to have made $3,865,475 on its opening weekend alone. And the following weekend, it grossed one point eight. It grossed one million eight hundred nineteen thousand two hundred three dollars, for a ten-day total of five million five hundred sixty-nine thousand three hundred thirty-four dollars. Eventually, the film in the U.S. went on to make thirty million dollars, and the budget for the film was only three million. So they made back ten times their budget they made back 10 times that amount in profit. That's pretty crazy. No wonder it kept making freaking more and more films. Now, there is something that... Now, a lot of people consider Freddy's Revenge to be a homoerotic sequel in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. There's a lot of subtones and there's a lot of talk on what the message was and what was and what they were trying to get across in this film. There's been a lot of subtext that claim there's been a lot of comments that the subtext of the film suggests that Jesse's a repressed homosexual. Wait, do we want to talk about this? I don't know if we want to talk about this. No, we don't need to talk about this. Okay. Let's just continue onward. Okay. So without further ado... So without further ado, let's dive into the plot of A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 Freddy's Revenge and find out what happens in the sequel. Although there's one thing I will say for those who haven't seen it. No. So A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 Freddy's Revenge kicks off five years after the first film. Nancy Thompson and her family, they've moved out of their home and now we see the Walshes are moving into Nancy Thompson's former home. They have a teenage son named Jesse who has a nightmare about being stalked by Freddy Krueger driving a school bus. He wakes up 
and completely attributes the dream to just the unusual heat in his room. He thinks he's too hot at night. So Jesse goes to school with his friend Lisa, who he's interested in romantically, but he's just way too shy to flirt with her and try to get some sort of relationship going. He gets into a fight with a boy named Grady during gym class, and Coach Schneider ends up having them both stay after class where they become good friends. Lisa comes to visit Jesse after school, and they end up finding Nancy Thompson's old diary, which detailed her nightmares with Freddy Krueger. Jesse reads this and sees a striking similarity to the dreams that he's been having lately. Small fires then begin to happen around the house, and the pet birds of the family all begin to spontaneously combust. Jesse's father then accuses him of sabotage. The following night, Jesse ends up having another nightmare, where he encounters Freddy, who tells him to kill for him. The dreams end up getting even more intense, and Jesse unsuccessfully attempts different measures to help try to keep himself awake. He eventually begins wandering the streets at night, and is caught by Schneider ordering a drink in a gay bar, and is made to run laps at school now as a punishment. Afterwards, Coach Snyder sends Jesse to the showers and gets attacked by an unseen force that drags him into the showers. Jesse vanishes into the steam and then Freddy emerges, killing Coach Snyder by slashing his back. After this, Jesse is completely horrified to see Freddy's glove on his own hand. He's escorted home by police after being found wandering the streets naked and his parents begin to suspect that Jesse's on some kind of drugs or is just mentally disturbed at this point. Though Lisa takes Jesse to an abandoned factory where Freddy Krueger had once worked. However, when they're going through the factory, they don't find anything there to help them. The next night, Jesse goes to Lisa's pool party and ends up kissing her in the cabana. But his body begins to change and he leaves the party in a panic. He heads over to Grady's house confesses to killing Schneider, and then instructs Grady to watch him as he sleeps and then stop him if he ends up trying to leave. Grady, though, eventually falls asleep, and Freddy emerges from Jesse's body and ends up killing Grady. Freddy then changes back to Jesse, who finds himself looking at Freddy's laughing reflection right back at him in Grady's mirror. He flees before Grady's parents enter the room and returns to Lisa's house. Of course, Jesse tells her everything that's going on, and Lisa realizes that Jesse's terror is what's giving Freddy his strength. But he can't stop fearing him and ends up transforming into him again. So Freddy locks Lisa's parents in their bedroom and then begins attacking Lisa, but realizes he can't harm her because of Jesse's influence. Freddy then goes outside where he begins to slaughter all the party goers in attendance. But Lisa's father shows up with a shotgun, although before he can take Freddy out, Lisa stops him from shooting Freddy. Lisa drives to the factory and starts facing sudden nightmares and the need to control her fear before confronting Freddy. She ends up pleading with Jesse to fight Freddy from inside, but Freddy's hold is just too strong. So Lisa then confesses her love for Jesse and kisses Freddy. This causes Jesse to fight back, Freddy combusts and turns into ash, then Jesse emerges from the rubble. Later on, we see Jesse, Lisa, and Lisa's friend Carrie taking the bus to school. Although Jesse begins to notice similarities to this and his original nightmare, so he panics. Lisa calms Jesse down, though, reminds them that they've taken out Freddy, he's dead. And Carrie says that all of it's over, although Freddy's clawed arm bursts through her chest. Freddy laughs as the bus drives into the field, just as in Jesse's first nightmare. There's definitely a lot of talk about this film and a lot of divide, I would say, on whether or not this is a good entry in the Nightmare on Elm Street series. And a lot of people don't like it because it was a sequel that wasn't directed by Wes Craven. A lot of people talk about the homoerotic subtext that's in the film. And we're not going to dive in and talk a lot about the homoerotic subtext in the overall themes of A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, but that is one that a lot of people talk about and a lot of people really say was what killed the movie in a sense and took away from Freddy Krueger. Personally, I don't think this was the best sequel. I think they did a good job in giving us Freddy Krueger again, but I don't think they did a good job in expanding on the story. 
they did a good they just did a good job of presenting Freddy Krueger in a way that is terrifying and giving him the power of possession in a sense but I don't feel like they did anything to really move the story along when it came to Freddy Krueger they didn't really give us more the more that I wanted from the first film you know the questions that needed to be answered I don't feel like the sequel did that right it's not until we get to a nightmare on elm street 3 that we really start to learn more about freddy and we start to get more of that story built into the franchise which is what we're going to get into next here from a critic standpoint as well a nightmare on elm street 2 freddy's revenge was a failure like yeah they made money right they made a lot of money they made 10 times their budget right on a three million dollar budget they made 30 million so from a financial perspective it was a success but from a critic perspective, it was an absolute failure. And because of this, New Line Cinema was completely unsure if they would even continue the Nightmare on Elm Street series. And the reason why they couldn't get Wes Craven to sign on for A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 was because he didn't want A Nightmare on Elm Street to turn into a franchise. But because of the fact that Freddy's Revenge sucked so much... <laughs> He had signed on to co-write the screenplay for A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors. However, he had done it with the intention that this was the film that was going to end the series. So originally, Wes Craven, for one, didn't want this to be a franchise, so it was only meant to be a one-and-done, and then came back on because he only wanted it to become a trilogy at the end of the day. We all know that there's way more films <laughs> that we're going to talk about, so this definitely isn't the end of the series, but Craven wanted this film to be the end of the series. The first concept that Craven had for the film was for Freddy Krueger to invade the real world. He would end up haunting the actors filming a new Nightmare on Elm Street sequel. However, New Line Cinema rejected the idea. However, we know that this concept was eventually brought to screen in New Nightmare, so we're going to be talking about that, of course, next week. Before it was decided what script would be used for the film's story, John Saxon and Robert Ungland both had written their own scripts for a third Nightmare on Elm Street film. In Saxon's script, it was called How the Nightmare on Elm Street All Began, which would have been a prequel story. Freddy would ultimately have turned out to have been innocent, or at least set up for the murders by Charles Manson, who, <laughs> yeah, I'm serious, <laughs> who along with his followers would have been the main culprit of the murders. Freddy would be forced by the mob of angry parents to make a confession of the crimes, which would then enrage them further. So after they lynch Freddy, he comes back to avenge his wrongful death by targeting the parents' children. Which I'm glad they didn't go with that concept, turning it, turning it out to be that, you know, Charles Manson framed Freddy Krueger. Like, come on. <laughs> Some Hellraiser shit right there. <laughs> I'm done. In Robert Unglin's version of the script, it was called Freddy's Funhouse and it would have seen Tina Gray's older sister coming back, who would have been in college when Tina was murdered, and ends up coming back to Springwood to investigate how she died. In the script, Freddy had claimed the 1428 Elm Street house for his own in the dream world, so he would set up booby traps like Nancy did against him. And according to Ungland, part of it later ended up actually being used in the pilot episode of Freddy's Nightmares, after the script had just been lying around and not used for a few years. And Wes Craven, when asked about the direction that they wanted to take the franchise in, he said that we decided that it could no longer be one person fighting Freddy. It had to be a group because the souls of Freddy's victims have now made Freddy stronger. He also called Heather Langenkamp to ask her if he may include her character Nancy in the script, which she agreed to. In interviews with the cast and crew in the DVD extras of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, it's revealed that the original idea for the film centered around the kids separately traveling to a specific location, only to die by suicide. Later, it would be discovered that the common link between the youths was that they dreamed of Freddy Krueger at one point. However, because of the triggering and nature around suicide itself, the storyline was abandoned. Some aspects, though, of the idea did still remain in the film. In the original script that Craven and Wagner had put together, the characters were somewhat different from what we see eventually have been filmed. Nancy wasn't a dream expert, or any kind of mental health professional at all. Kristen only stayed in the institution for a short while. She had a father, and her mother was named Alice. And because Wes Craven wasn't available at the time for the actual directorial duties of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, they had brought Chuck Russell on to be the director of the film. 
and he had stated that Craven's original script for the film was much darker and more profane than what we saw in the actual film. One of the most memorable scenes in A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors is the sequence that take place in the junkyard. The junkyard sequence and the set itself were the product of art director Mick Strawn. Mick also handled some special effects sequences on the film and became the production designer on the sequel, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, of course. The storyboards used for shooting were supplied by Pete Von Scholle. The Royce Hall building on the University of California campus was what was used for the exteriors of the Weston Hills Psychiatric Hospital, while the St. Brendan Catholic Church was what was used for the church scenes. And the scenes in Freddy's boiler room were filmed at a converted warehouse across the street from Los Angeles County Jail. And Mark Showstrom, who was also doing work on the set of Evil Dead 2, is suspected to have smuggled the Freddy glove out because it was actually seen later on in Evil Dead 2. And of course, Sam Raimi's used it in Ash vs. Evil Dead as another Easter egg. But it's said that Mark Showstrom was the one who took the glove off the set and then put it in the Evil Dead 2 movie as an Easter egg. The special effects of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 were created by a team led by Peter Chesney, who included Kevin Yeager and Mark Showstrom. For the iconic death scene of Jennifer, you know, where her body's ho hoisted into the air, Showstrom created a dummy of Penelope Sodro with fully flexible limbs out of fiberglass and urethane, and then put a matching wig on the dummy. The team built five fake televisions, each with different functions, with one being equipped with a rubber membrane, which a dummy of Freddy's head pushed up through, after which they substituted the dummy, of course, with Ungland. Another was equipped with the metal arms, which included Freddy's finger blades and vacuum tubes from real televisions. And this was the scene where, in my opinion, we get the most iconic Freddy Krueger line. The one line that everybody knows. And fun fact on this, this line was not included in the original script. This was ad-libbed by Robert Ungland. So the reason why Freddy Krueger has this catchphrase is because Robert Ungland created it. He ad-libbed it. And that line is, Welcome to primetime, bitch. <laughs> he fucking ad-libbed that line. That is dope. That is another reason why Robert Ungland is Freddy Krueger. Like, he put himself into this role on so many levels. For Taryn's death scene in A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, the team had originally tried for an effect where her head would explode after being injected with drugs, but they couldn't make this effect work in practical, so instead, they put appliances on Jennifer Rubin's body to show the withering effects of the injection. The skeletal version of the girl that Kristen is holding in the intro sequence of the film was originally a surreal mechanical corpse dummy created by Showstrom, but it turned out to be too good for its purpose, because Russell was so unnerved by its appearance that he didn't put it in the film, <laughs> but had it replaced instead by a simpler decayed skeleton. Like, how crazy and good was it that you're making the film and you're so turned off by it and unnerved that you actually had to change it because you couldn't put it on film? Like, that's crazy. That is a sign of a good special effects or practical effects designer right there. The theme song for A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, called Dream Warriors, was written and performed by an American heavy metal band named Dokken. Probably butchered that too, but doing my best. The single was a success, and a decision was made to include heavy metal songs in the soundtrack of sequels going forward. The band's manager, Cliff Bernstein, was acquainted with Wes Craven, and was able to get a copy of the film script as reference for the lyrics. Robert Unglund as Freddy then helped provide unique footage for the band so they could use it for the music video. And this is a great example of music and film colliding, right? And music propelling film. I'm a huge supporter of having music in film because I feel that music is what sets the mood. It's what gets you into it. It's what even makes you remember the film later on. Like, there's not enough films now that have you know, mainstream music in them. Like, yeah, they have, you know, their own music and stuff like that, but not mainstream music that you hear every day or that you listen to yourself, right? And I think that's another reason why Master of Puppets hit so hard with Stranger Things because of the fact that movies and TV don't use music like they used to anymore. Maybe that's because of licensing rights. Maybe, you know, licensing fees have jacked up in the age of, of digital, but it doesn't happen anymore. And I, I feel like that's a shame because a lot of times you'll listen to songs 
from you know the 80s, the 90s, even early 2000s. And I guarantee you, some of those songs you listen to will remind you of a movie because that song was in a movie. It's great. It's great marketing for a movie, and it's nostalgic for you if you love that movie. I, I'm just, I'm a huge, you know, supporter for having music in movies, and I think it, there needs to be more of it. There really does. A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors was theatrically released in the United States by New Line Cinema in February of 1987. This was also the first film for New Line Cinema to open nationally. It opened in 1,343 theaters and debuted at number one, had a weekend gross of $8.9 million, and went on to make $44,793,222 at the box office. It crushed A Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Like, it crushed it. It made it the highest grossing film for the studio that year, and is also the third highest grossing film in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, behind Freddy vs. Jason and A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, Dream Master. So without further ado, let's dive in, and let's talk about the plot of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. So the year is now 1987. It's two years after A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, and we see a teenager named Kristen Parker, who's dreaming about Freddy Krueger chasing her. He attacks her in her bathroom after she thinks that she's already awake, which makes it look like that she slit her wrists in the real world. Kristen's mother then believes that she's suicidal, so she admits her to Weston Hills Psychiatric Hospital, where she gets placed under the care of Dr. Neil Gordon. At the hospital, Kristen fights the orderlies because they're trying to sedate her and she fears falling asleep. The new intern therapist at the hospital just happens to be Nancy Thompson. She's, of course, one of Freddy's first victims from the first Nightmare on Elm Street film. Nancy calms her down and befriends her by reciting part of Freddy's nursery rhyme. Nancy is then introduced to the rest of Dr. Gordon's patients. We see Philip, who's a habitual sleepwalker, Kincaid, who's a tough kid from the streets who's prone to violence, Jennifer, who's a hopeful television actress prone to cigarette burns, and Will, who uses a wheelchair because of a prior suicide attempt. There's also Taryn, a recovering drug addict, Joey, who's the youngest and too traumatized to speak, is there as well. One night at the hospital, Freddy ends up attacking Kristen in her dreams, but she unwittingly pulls Nancy into her dream, which allows them to escape. Kristen reveals that she's been able to pull people into her dreams since she was young. Over the next two nights, Freddy throws Philip off a roof and kills Jennifer by smashing her head into a television. In the next group therapy session, Nancy reveals to the remaining patients who are still alive that they are the last of the Elm Street kids, the surviving children of those who banded together and burned Kruger to death many years ago. Great concept, right? Both Nancy and Neil encourage the kids to try group hypnosis so that they can experience a shared dream and discover their dream powers. In the dream, Joey ends up wandering off and gets captured by Freddy, which leaves him comatose in the real world. Nancy and Neil, they get relieved of duty at the hospital. So a nun, Sister Mary Helena, tells Neil that Freddy is the son of a young woman on the hospital staff who was accidentally locked in a room with hundreds of mental patients, and they had sexually assaulted her continually, and that the only way to stop him is to lay his bones to rest. So he and Nancy ask her father, Officer Donald Thompson, where the bones are hidden. But he's completely uncooperative. He's not going to give them anything on where they had buried Freddy's body. So Nancy rushes back to the hospital when she learns that Kristen has actually now been sedated. Neil stays behind to try to convince Donald to help them. Nancy and the others engage in group hypnosis to reunite with Kristen, but all of them end up getting separated by Freddy. Taryn and Will are killed by Freddy, while Kristen, Nancy, and Kincaid end up finding one another. The three of them rescue Joey, but they're unable to defeat Freddy because now he's become way too powerful with all the souls he's absorbed. Freddy starts sensing that his remains have been found, so he appropriates his own skeleton and kills Donald before incapacitating Neil. Freddy returns to attack the others, but Joey uses his dream power voice to repel Freddy. Donald tells Nancy that he's crossing over into the dream world, but he is revealed to be Freddy and ends up stabbing Nancy in the stomach and tosses her aside. Freddy believes that Nancy's dead and comes upon Kristen in order to kill her, 
but Nancy ends up stabbing him with his own glove. Neil manages to recover and purifies Freddy's bones, which effectively kill him. After Nancy ends up dying, Kristen manages to wake everybody up and return them to the real world. During the funeral for the patients, Neil finds Amanda Kruger's tombstone and discovers that she's actually Sister Mary Helena. That same evening, he goes to sleep with the Malaysian doll that Nancy had given him and Kristen's paper mache house nearby. Suddenly, Kristen's house lights up from the inside, suggesting that Freddy is not completely defeated. And that's a great way to end the film and a great way to end the franchise, right? Because as I was saying earlier, Wes Craven came back to this film, co-wrote the screenplay with the intention, this would be it. This was Freddy's swan song. This is it. This is the end of a Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. So a good way to end it, right? You bring back the original final girl. You have her kill Freddy. She dies with them, which is kind of what I wanted with Halloween ends. But anyways, <laughs> sorry, I had to. I had to. It's a good ending. It, it was a good ending to the film, and it would have been a good ending to the franchise as well. Because it does leave the room open, right? It does leave an opening for Freddy Krueger to come back and terrify more teenagers later on in life. Because you don't know for sure if he's dead. It, it's suspected. You don't actually see Freddy. You don't see his glove. You don't see him kill. Like, it's not like the other two films where it was obvious that Freddy's still alive. It's just insinuated a little bit, subtly right? To leave that door open, which I think was a great end to it. And it would have been a great end to the franchise, but we know <laughs> it is not the end of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, because next we're going to be going over A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. And it was probably the fact that A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 made so much money and it was such a commercial success. And the fact that people loved it, right? Like it was a good one. I did like that entry of the, of the franchise. And I think that's what really pushed Wes Craven to be like, okay, let's do another one. <laughs> because he had actually presented his own pitch for a fourth Elm Street film. But the producers, Sarah Risher and Robert Shea, turned it down. Because they wanted to go with the Dream Master pitch as a progression of the Dream Warriors concept from the previous film. They wanted to continue the story of Dream Warriors. They wanted to take that film that was such a success and just continue that. Just, just... Keep going with that. It's making money. It's doing good. People liked it. Let's continue with that concept. The idea that Craven pitched, Shea felt that it just didn't have the impact that the producers were looking for. And then later on, Craven was actually approached for rewrites to the script, but he turned down the offer because he felt that they should have been approached as artists of the original material to begin with. So he's not going to do rewrites. He wanted to do it to begin with, so he turned them down. There was definitely a lot of rushing and turmoil that went on with A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Because Dream Master went through a few different directors and they started even filming it before they had a director. New Line Cinema was super desperate to get Nightmare 4 going. They lacked a script and a director for the film at the time. Mike DeLuca ended up begging Brian Helgel End to have a try at it and come up with a script within two weeks. So he went to his parents' house, finished the script within nine days, sent it to New Line Cinema. And the script was basically a rewrite of the original script. And then Ken and Jim Wheat were brought in for further polishes. And then they brought in director Tom McLaughlin <laughs> to, to, to do more work on the film. However, he had a stipulation. He had just came off of doing Jason Lives Friday the 13th Part 6. And he wanted to have full creative control of the film if he was going to be the director. However, they'd already begun filming the film, even though they didn't have a director, so they couldn't give him creative control, so he couldn't come on board. So eventually, the director's chair was given to Rennie Harlan, who had previously directed a couple of low-budget feature films in Finland. He did a Finnish action film called Born American, and then an American horror film called Prison. And then producers of the film were kind of worried, because... Audiences were familiar with Freddy at this stage, right? They already had three movies of Freddy, so it would be hard to replicate the scare factor from the films before it. Instead, they decided to continue in the same way that Dream Warriors did, rather than focusing on pure horror. In the creative process for A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, it was bogged down by the untimely strike of the Writers Guild of America in 1988. It went from March 7th to August 7th of 1988 which forced Harlan and the producers to completely improvise 
a lot during the filming. Lisa Wilcox and Andrus Jones ended up writing their own dialogue for Alice and Rick after the death of Kristen. Many of the nightmare scenes in the film were made up from ideas that Harlan came up with rather than from what the writers had scripted. And that same junkyard set from A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 is featured in A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Strawn had also come up with the truck crash scene and the kaleidoscope hallway. The junkyard set is the only set used in more than one film in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. It is the only set, and it was built and filmed at a landfill in Pacoima, California. I think I said that right. Pacoima? Pacoima, California. I think I got that. So A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, was released on August 19, 1988, to 1,765 theaters in North America. The film came out number one on its opening weekend, ended up grossing $12,883,403, and went on to gross a total of $49,369,899 at the U.S. box office. And it was actually the highest grossing Nightmare on Elm Street film until Freddy vs. Jason was released in 2003. So let's dive in. Let's talk about A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, and see where Freddy takes us in this film. So the years 1988 were one year past from the events of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Kristen, Kincaid, and Joey have all been released from Weston Hills, and they're back to their lives as normal teenagers and their families. However, Kristen believes that Freddy Krueger is going to come back, and when she dreams that she's in Freddy's old boiler room, she ends up summoning Joey and Kincaid into the dream. Kincaid and Joey are upset that she's reverted to her old ways back when they were at Weston Hills, so to keep her calm, they take her to the boiler room and show her that it's ice cold. Kristen had also summoned Kincaid's dog Jason into the dream, and the dog jumps out of the boiler, bites Kristen, and they all wake up in their rooms. The next day, Kristen meets up with her boyfriend, a martial arts enthusiast named Rick Johnson. And their friends are there as well. We have Rick's shy and quiet sister, Alice. We have Sheila, who's an asthmatic genius. And Debbie, who's a tough girl who doesn't like bugs. Kincaid and Joey confront Kristen at school about their dream. They tell her to let it go, that their days of fighting and dreams are over. And if she keeps going at it, she might accidentally bring Kruger back to life. That same night, Kristen stays awake to keep herself from dreaming but Kincaid ends up falling asleep. He wakes up in a junkyard, where Freddy has now been accidentally resurrected. Kincaid puts up a good fight against Freddy, but, of course, Freddy ends up overpowering him. Kincaid screams for Kristen, but Freddy reaches him and kills him first. Joey's watching MTV and listening to music in his room when he begins to fall asleep and discovers a model from one of his posters swimming in his waterbed. However, it's not a model in his waterbed. It's Freddy. Freddy jumps out of the waterbed and attempts to drown Joey. Joey, of course, he screams for Kristen to help him, but Freddy stabs him and kills him. At school the next day, Kristen panics when she notices that both Joey and Kincaid are missing and then accidentally knocks herself out as Rick attempts to calm her. So, of course, she's now in Freddy's dream world. Freddy tries to attack Kristen as the school nurse wakes her up from her slumber. Kristen feels guilty about staying awake when she learns that Kincaid and Joey were both found dead. She later tells Rick, Alice, and Alice's crush Dan Jordan about Freddy Krueger, and she vows to avenge the deaths of Kincaid and Joey and take out Freddy once and for all. Later on that night at dinner, Kristen realizes that her mother has put sleeping pills in her dinner, and she starts to fall asleep as she tries to run out of the dining room. So her dream begins, and Kristen and Freddy go to war. Freddy overcomes her attempts to repel him and forces her back to his home. And since Kristen is the last of the Elm Street children to still be alive, Freddy goads Kristen into summoning one of her friends into the dream so that the real fun can begin anew. So she ends up calling Alice into her dream. And Freddy throws Kristen into his boiler before she dies. But before she dies, Kristen gives Alice her dream power. Alice wakes up with the sense that something's wrong and takes Rick to Kristen's house. Of course, when they get there, they see that Kristen's bedroom is on fire with her inside of it. Later on, Alice falls asleep during class and inadvertently brings Sheila into her dream. Freddy ends up killing Sheila and makes it look like an asthma attack. This is when Rick starts to believe Alice. But the following day, 
He has a dream where an invisible Freddy attacks him in a martial arts dojo, which was a pretty sweet scene. That martial arts dojo scene, that was a pretty sweet scene. Rick ends up fighting Freddy and manages to knock his glove off. However, the glove levitates and stabs him repeatedly and kills him. With each death that's happening, Alice is noticing that changes are happening. She gains the abilities and personalities of all her dead friends. So she makes plans with Debbie and Dan to fight and kill Freddy Krueger together. But when her father keeps her inside, Alice ends up falling asleep. Through Alice, Freddy ends up stalking Debbie and transforms her into a cockroach and crushes her in a roach motel. <laughs> Using uh, Debbie's temper, Alice tries to ram Freddy but collides with a tree in reality which injures Dan. Dan gets rushed into surgery while Alice returns home and readies herself to join him and face Freddy. In the dream sequence, Alice rescues Dan, and the two find themselves in an old church. Dan gets injured in the dream, which prompts his surgeons to wake him up. Alice now has to face Freddy alone. Freddy has the upper hand here due to his experience, but she uses her friends' dream powers against him. And when he's about to win, Alice remembers a nursery rhyme called the Dream Master. She recites it and forces Freddy to face his own reflection, which causes the souls within him to completely revolt. This tears Freddy apart, and Alice's friend's souls are released, leaving Freddy as a hollow husk. Months later down the line, we see Dan and Alice are on a date, when Dan tosses a coin into a fountain. For a moment, Alice sees Freddy's reflection in the water, which implies of course he's still alive, but she completely ignores it. Dan asks her, you know, what did you wish for? But Alice doesn't tell him, as they walk away from the fountain. 80s horror movies like, you know, Nightmare, Halloween... Uh, Friday, they all had a way of just letting you know it wasn't quite over, right? <laughs> like, you always wanted that closure. You always wanted it to be like, all right, this is the time where they got Freddy, you know? But they always did that little tease at the end of the film that's like, eh, maybe not. I don't know if he's quite dead yet. He's probably not. And we know he's not because next week <laughs> we've got three more movies to go over. And that wraps us up for this week's episode of going over A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, and A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. For more horror content and updates on the podcast, make sure you're following me on Instagram, Cabin of Horrors Podcast. Also, make sure you're following me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Cabin of Horrors. We're going to be making a triumphant comeback on Twitch April 13th when we release our brand new project, A Nightmare on the 13th, which is going to be absolutely incredible. This is going to be so much fun for all of us to enjoy. And not only will it be a reimagining of your favorite horror movies, like I mentioned in last week's episode, but we're also going to watch a movie because there's so many great public domain movies that we can watch live on Twitch because they're public domain. And like I'm talking movies like A Night of the Living Dead. Uh, there's a lot of Boris Karloff movies, Vincent Price movies that we can watch. So we're going to add that in to A Nightmare on the 13th. We are going to be watching a public domain horror movie. And it's probably one you've never seen before. So make sure you're following me on Twitch. We'll be going live starting April 13th and every 13th of the month after that. And there'll probably be other Twitch events as well. But this is the first one coming in on April 13th. So make sure you're following. And make sure you're following me on Instagram as well. Like I said, I will be back to you guys again next week with a brand new episode where we go over A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, A Nightmare on Elm Street 6, and New Nightmare. And we will just discuss the reboot a little bit. A little bit. I don't want to give that reboot that much attention, but we'll give it a little bit. A little bit of look. But that's about it. Until next week, guys. See you in the shadows.